This morning, as I've said, we're continuing in John's Gospel, chapter 1. We're looking at the last few verses of his prologue. Uh, the prologue is simply his introduction to the Gospel, and as you know, the Gospel, as I've already mentioned, is an eyewitness account of his life, this one written by the disciple that Jesus loved. That is the Apostle John, the same one who wrote the three letters by his name, and the, uh, the book of Revelation. Now, as I mentioned before too, the prologue is so full. Um, it's written so simply, and yet it, it is so full that we're not gonna be able to touch on absolutely everything, but uh, being the kind of person I am, I try to. <laughs> So uh, hopefully it's not going to be uh, uh, too complicated. <laughs> but I do want you to see that in this section we're looking at, John certainly is emphasizing the deity of Christ. We're moving into a section where he's going to be emphasizing a bit more his humanity. The Word becomes flesh and he dwells among us. He tabernacles among us. He pitches his tent and he lives among us. And this was necessary that he do this, that he might bring about the fulfillment of God's truth, that he might bring about the fulfillment of the Old Testament and in doing so bring grace and become the source of truth and grace to everyone who will trust in him. Basically, that's the message we're looking at. It's very simple, and yet it's, it's quite full when we, when we get into the details. Well, let me begin by reading again the entire prologue, John chapter 1, verses 1 through 18. This is what we read. This is what John writes by the inspiration of the Spirit. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being through Him, and apart from Him nothing came into being that has come into being. In Him was life, and the life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness. And the darkness did not comprehend it. There came a man sent from God whose name was John. He came as a witness to testify about the light so that all might believe through him. He was not the light, but he came to testify about the light. There was the true light, which coming into the world enlightens every man. He was in the world, and the world was made through him, and the world did not know him. He came to his own, and those who were his own did not receive him. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God, even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory. Glory is of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. For of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. For the law was given through Moses. Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father. He has explained him. Well, may the Lord bless his word to our hearing this morning. Again, um, John covers a lot of ground in just these few verses. But uh, we're going to do the best we can uh, to get through this. Now, let me just give one, um, uh, well, make one announcement before I start. I, I wasn't able to get this finished. It's really hard to figure out sometimes what John is saying. And so the book of John is going to be a kind of a tough, tough ground to cover. I mentioned before that it's the one we recommend that new converts read because of its simple language and yet it's the most difficult one to understand because of the ideas that John writes. He, he can encapsulate so much in, in such few words and such simple words. So it's not you know just so straightforward as it were like the other gospels but it's a little bit more theological so anyway because of that I wasn't able to get the notes to um, the, the crew up on top soon enough so I, I don't think we're going to have the, the text displayed but don't despair did you bring your Bible this morning we can do it the old-fashioned way okay 
I'd recommend that you just simply keep your Bibles open to the text we're looking at, verses 14 through 18, and we'll just we'll look at those. Uh, I am going to make reference to other texts, but I'll just be drawing a point or two out of them. Just listen to them while they're read. I think you'll, you'll probably get what you, or at least what I'm hoping you'll see from them. So anyway, as I've said this morning, we're going to finish looking at, at this introduction that John wrote to his gospel as he introduces to us the great subject of his book, which is Jesus Christ. And again, reminding you, as I've had numerous times already, he gives us the full purpose for why he wrote at the end of his book, which is what he seems to be doing in, in his writings. And the summary is, I've written these things, I've written these signs, I've, I've, I've collected these particular elements of his life and have revealed these things to you so that you may know Jesus is the Christ, the one who was promised by Moses, the one God had been telling us about for many years, and that he is the Son of God. And that believing in him, you may have life in his name. This is the purpose of the book, and so that's what John is after. And we need to understand everything in that light. Now, so far, he's been declaring to us that Jesus is, a matter of fact, God. He is God, as we're going to see this morning, in human flesh. Not a God, as Jehovah's Witnesses believe. And we've seen all the ins and outs of that. I would refer you to previous sermons. He is the God. Now not only does John say it as plainly as you could possibly say it, the Word was God, but he tells us that there are things that are true about Jesus that could only be true of him if he was in fact God. That he is eternal. He was in the beginning with God. That he is the Creator. All things came into being through him and without him nothing has came into being that has come into being. That he has life in himself. He is the one who gives life to us. He's the one who gave life to the first man, Adam, in the garden after he had formed his body from the dust of the ground. He breathed into his soul the breath of life. And by the way, when that breath of life departs, that's why your body returns to dust. Can't live without that life. Well, Jesus is that life. He's the one who imparts life. John tells us he is the light of men. He's the one who gave us not only physical life, but a rational soul so that we can see, we can think, we can understand. That's one of the reasons why Jesus is called the Logos. He is the Word of God. He is the reason of God. He's the one who gives man the ability to reflect that particular attribute of God, that God thinks, God wills, God understands, God can imagine. Jesus is the one who is the light, who gives light to everyone who comes into the world through natural revelation. And of course, he gives man reason so he can see it. And of course, he was the one who as we're going to see even more clearly this morning, who appeared in the Old Testament, the angel of the Lord, who was called the Lord himself, or these theophanies. We know these are appearances of God, but we also know that was not the Father who appeared there. That was Jesus in his pre-incarnate state when he was in the garden creating man or walking with man, or again as he appears to his people throughout the years. And yet John has told us when Jesus came into the world, even having been in the world, even having revealed himself in, in so many ways to the world, the world did not know him. They refused to acknowledge him. Even when he came to his own people, his own people, the Jews, would not receive him. But John reminds us there were those who did. And it wasn't because they were related to Abraham. It wasn't because of blood. Nor is it because they were persuaded by others, not the will of man. It's not because they saw him and desired him for themselves. It wasn't of their flesh. But solely because of God's mercy. Because they were born of God. God revealed that fullness of truth and grace in the Lord Jesus Christ to them. And again, I would remind you, if you're a Christian here this morning, if you're trusting Jesus Christ, it's only because of God's mercy towards you. You have been born of God. Now before John begins the account of Jesus' life on earth, he does want to point out one more thing about him, something we might consider the culmination of everything that he's just told us. That there are those who were born of God, are born of God, and will be born of God because Jesus came into the world to bring about grace and truth. Basically, I want us to see two things this morning. 
God became a man, and he became a man that he might become the source of God's truth and grace to all who will trust in him. Now, I'm going to just deal lightly with the subject God became a man this morning because it is a very large subject, and I'm going to finish that this evening. We're going to look at the mystery of the incarnation, how it is that Jesus can be both God and man at the same time, and what that means, and how we understand that. This morning, though, I just want to look at the fact, first of all, that that is what happened. Let's consider that God became a man. John writes in verse 14, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw His glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now John is answering for us the question, who is Jesus Christ? He's told us, first of all, that he is the words, and we know that what he means by that is he is God. But he is the word who became flesh. John uses the word flesh here to refer to that nature that Jesus took, another nature that he took to himself when he came into the world. Now, you know as well as I do that the word flesh is a loaded term, and it can sometimes refer to the sin nature. It refers to that which we as Christians constantly have to fight against. The reason why God gave us his spirit was so that we might fight against it. Paul writes in Galatians 5.16, But I say, walk by the spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. And he reminds us in Romans 8, verses 12 through 14. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh, for if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. For all who are being led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. Flesh refers to the sinful nature. Flesh refers to that which we are to be fighting against and that we must fight against if we are to see heaven. Living according to the flesh means living according to whatever desires you may have for the things of the world and things that you shouldn't have, just living by, again, you know, what it is you want instead of living by the Word of God. Living by the Spirit means God, by the Spirit, gives you the power to live according to His Word. That's what distinguishes a Christian from a non-Christian. Well, obviously, that's not what John means. When Jesus became flesh, He was and is without sin. Here, He uses it in terms of of simply the human nature. Well, the author to the Hebrews reminds us that Jesus had no sin, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. By the way, this is the reason why, one of the reasons why, Jesus came into the world and took our nature upon himself was so that he might experience what we experience and be able to sympathize with us. He was tempted at all points as we were, yet he did not sin. He knows how to help you. He knows how to help me when we are tempted to sin, to overcome it. No, John is referring to his human nature, and it's, again, the same thing that Paul is going to be talking about this evening in our passage in Philippians. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of, sin, or likeness of men. Philippians 2, verses 5 through 7. The Word became flesh. Now John further emphasizes this fact that Jesus became a man when he writes that he dwelt among us in verse 14. The word here, dwelt, literally means to pitch a tent or to live in a tent. Uh, Paul uses the same word, actually the noun form of the verb that John uses here, to refer to our own bodies, that we too are living in tents while we are in this world. And one day we're going to you know, cast aside these tents and we're going to be with the Lord. He says in 2 Corinthians 5.1, for we know that if the earthly tent, which is our house, is torn down, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. And that is, of course, a tremendous encouragement, blessing, 
and the hope that we have as we see our tents wearing out that God has prepared an eternal dwelling. These tents are only temporary, but God has a permanent dwelling for us to live in in heaven when our bodies are glorified. Well, the point here is that Jesus pitched his tent among us. He became one with us. By the way, as an interesting side note, um, I, thought, I thought it was interesting that the word tent also is translated tabernacle. And we, we read about the tabernacle, which was the original building that God commanded Moses to put up, where he might dwell among his people. That was just simply a tent. Okay, that's what, it, what tabernacle means, tents, fancy word for that. But it was also a picture of Jesus Christ. Maybe we understand the tabernacle to be a picture of Jesus because inside the priests were offering sacrifices. Inside those sacrifices were picturing the sacrifice Jesus would make. The priesthood and the sacrifices were both pictures of Jesus. And we understand that that was a grand uh, preview of what Jesus was going to do for us but do you realize that the tent itself was a picture of Jesus? Because what was inside the tent? Well, not just the priest, not just the sacrifices, but in the, the innermost chamber, in the Holy of Holies, the Shekinah glory of God was dwelling. In other words, God lived inside that tent. God had pitched his tent among men, and that's how he dwelt among his people. But you see, that's exactly what Jesus is. He is God in human flesh. God pitched another tent, and that tent was humanity. And he came into this world in order to be our priest and to offer himself as a sacrifice for our sins that we might receive his mercy and his grace. So John wants to emphasize for us here that the one who is God became flesh. He became fully man in order that he might save us in order that he might bring what we're going to see actually under point two. But before we move on to point two, let me just point out again several things that John gives us here to remind us who Jesus is. Jesus did have to become a man in order to take our place in God's justice. He became a man in order to obey for us and to lay down his life for us. He had to be one with us in order to do that, but you know well by now that he also had to be God so that he would be able to offer a sacrifice that was valuable enough to atone for our sins. This one who became a man had to be God because only one who was infinitely worthy could pay for sins that are infinitely serious. That's why hell exists, remember? That's why it goes on forever because we can never suffer enough for the crimes we have committed against God. We need an infinite payment, and Jesus had to be God to give us that infinite payment. Now, John has already told us that Jesus is God, but he emphasizes this again and again in, in our text this morning. He says in verse 14 again, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. You know, I think it's interesting that in this gospel, John, over and over again, is emphasizing this. This was the purpose for his writing the gospel. It's the reason why he selected the signs that he did. It's the reason why he's writing this prologue. is because he wants us to know that Jesus is God. But it's interesting when he gets to his first letter, that what he emphasizes there is not so much the deity of Christ, but his humanity, that he became a true man. And the reason, again, is because of the purpose of both the gospel and this letter. In the gospel, he's trying to prove to the, to the Jews that Jesus is more than just a man, that he is the Christ, he is the Son of God. But when he writes his first letter, he's trying to prove to Christians that, you know, who are being influenced by this, what was called a, a proto-Gnostic idea, this Greek dualism, this idea that matter was evil and only spirit is good, and if, if Jesus is God, he could never really become a man because that's evil. But he emphasizes that he is, in fact, a man. And if you don't believe that, then you're the, you have the spirit of the Antichrist. You can't be saved. I mean, listen to what John says in the opening of his letter. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes, what we looked at and touched with our hands concerning the word of life. 
Stressing the fact that, yes, Jesus was here. I saw him and I touched him and he was solid. He was real. He was physical. But yet in his gospel, he is stressing, it seems much more strongly, the fact that he is God. And that, I think, is because of the Jews and the, the idea. Remember how, what the Jews thought when Jesus said, before Abraham was born, I am. I and the Father are one. They picked up stones and they wanted to kill him because he, being a man, was making himself out to be God. Well, John is trying to prove to us that he is, in fact, God, which is why we have, again, more and more of a stress upon that in these various things that he's saying. He writes, we saw his glory. Glory is of the only begotten from the Father. And John here doesn't mean that when we looked at Jesus, he was glowing like a light bulb. It's not that he was shining as he did in that that pillar of fire that led the Israelites by night out of Egypt, that pillar of fire was Jesus, by the way. It was the angel of the Lord, and he was appearing in this theophany, and it, it glowed with this luminescence. That was a part of God's glory. So did the Shekinah cloud when it was inside the temple. It was shining. It was luminous. That was Jesus breaking into history, but that's not what John is referring to there, but rather that he, as he looked at Jesus... He saw God's character. He saw the reflection of God as Jesus is the image of God. The author of the Hebrews writes this in Hebrews 1.3. And he, that is Jesus, is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. He was as it were, shining with the glory of God's character and of his image. This was a glory that could only be in the one, John tells us, who is the only begotten from the Father. In the one who is the eternal Son, not the one who just comes into the world in time, born of the Virgin, but the one who is eternally begotten, as he says in verse 18, the only begotten God. Let's let's see the Jehovah's Witnesses wrestle with that particular text, right? In verse 18, he says this, No one has seen God at any time. The only begotten God, who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. Again, you want another passage to prove the deity of Jesus Christ? Here is that passage. Jesus is the eternally begotten Son of God. He was begotten in eternity. He's, you know, that means that there was never a time when he was not, but... He has always existed as the Son of God. He was in the beginning with God, as we've seen, and He is the only begotten God. Now, I do want you to notice that here again we see two persons referred to as God. We have God. No one has seen God at any time, but the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, He has revealed Him. Again, we saw in verse 1, the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The first reference has to do with the Father. No one has seen God at any time. And this reminds us that when he appears in the Old Testament as the angel of the Lord, or in these theophanies as the pillar of fire, or in the garden as God, as it were, reaches down and forms man from the dust of the ground and breathes into his nostrils the breath of life, that wasn't the Father who was doing that. That wasn't the Father that the Israelites saw in the angel of the Lord or in these theophanies. This is the Son of God, the only begotten God, the one who was in the bosom of the Father, or as John states it, the one who was with God in verse 1. He was in the world even then to reveal God's glory. But now, John says, he has become a man to reveal the Father even more fully. Again, verse 18, the only begotten God who is in the bosom of the Father, he has explained him. By the way, the word explained there is the same word from which we get our word exegete. Maybe you've heard that word before. To exegete something means to dig into it, you know, to take it apart and to figure out what it means and then to explain it. Well, that's exactly why Jesus came into the world. He came to explain God to us. He came to explain the Father. He is the image of God, and who's better suited to explain God than God himself? So John is telling us that Jesus is God because only one who is God can actually hope to explain him.
that Jesus as God is also implied by what John the Baptist said regarding him in verse 15. This was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. Now this, I believe, is referring to a time after the time that Jesus came to John the Baptist and was baptized by him. He says, this was he of whom I said. You know, when Jesus came to John, John said I didn't recognize him, but then the Father revealed him to me because I saw the Spirit of God descending as a dove and lighting upon him or resting upon him. And then I saw this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This was he of whom I said, he who comes after me has a higher rank than I do. What do you mean he comes after John? Well, remember John was born six months before Jesus was, right? And John's ministry began six months before Jesus' ministry began. He was sent to prepare the way before Jesus. Well, the one who comes after me, that is the one who's, whose way I've prepared, has a higher rank than I do. Even though Jesus was conceived six months before John, he existed before him. He has a higher rank than I because he existed before me. We've already seen. He is eternal with the Father. John is merely the messenger who is to prepare his way, but Jesus is the Lord who is coming. He is God in human flesh. So again, the emphasis John gives to us on who Jesus is. He is God who has become man in order to save us. So the Son of God became a man to save us. The Son of God became a man that he might reveal or explain the Father to us. But now here's the main point that John makes, and this is a briefer point, but we don't want to miss it. He became a man that he might reveal something else about God, and that is his truth and his grace. Again, verse 14, the Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we saw his glory, glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. This glory that John was talking about that we see in Jesus Christ was more than that he was the only begotten from the Father. It is that he is full of grace and truth. In Jesus, we, these things are not only revealed, they are actually fulfilled and made available to us. We see them revealed. Now, I want you to notice the contrast that John draws between Jesus and what he brings and Moses and what it is that he had brought. God's grace and truth were partially revealed in the Old Testament, in the law given through Moses. There was the moral law, the civil law, and the ceremonial law. And very briefly, God was showing his people how to live in the moral law. He was also showing them their sins in the Ten Commandments. If you want to know how to live to please God, then you can study the commandments because they tell you what is right and they tell you what is sin. And if we're talking about how to live, those are the two things that you need to know. The civil law was simply the moral law applied to that particular society at that particular time. Now in that sense, you can study the civil law to see how the moral law can be applied, how it should be applied. It's a further revelation of the moral law. The ceremonial law, though, was a revelation of God's grace. Remember, God gave his law, and that, the moral law, and the law was broken. But when they broke the law, God did not enact the penalty, which was death, but rather he ordained a priesthood to offer sacrifices that would cover over their sins. And if somebody brought a sacrifice to the Lord and they saw in that sacrifice the lamb that God had promised that he was going to send into the world years from then, they were actually forgiven. There was grace and there was truth in the Old Covenant. But in the New Covenant, John tells us that grace and that truth are more fully revealed in Jesus Christ. He says in verse 17, For the law was given through Moses... Grace and truth were realized through Jesus Christ. What he means is Jesus is the reality. He is the truth behind the moral law, 
the civil law and the ceremonial law. Uh, the one that they were pointing to. The one who would fulfill them. As the God-man, we know that Jesus came into the world and he fulfilled the moral law that he might be able to give us a perfect righteousness and a perfect example of how we are to live. You want to know how to live? Don't just read the commandments, but look at how Jesus lived those commandments and follow his example. He's the revelation of God's truth in the sense that he is the fulfillment of all the prophecies and all the promises. We know what God meant by looking at Jesus. And by his fulfilling the, the ceremonial law, of course, by dying on the cross, that he might provide an atonement for sin. He becomes the source of grace to us. Through his work, grace and truth are fully realized. They actually come into being in the gospel. Now I want you to, to notice something here and something we're all very much aware of but something that, again, John wants us to know, that the new covenant is much better than the old covenant. I think we'd all agree to that, right? Now, because though God was already giving truth and grace, but particularly grace in the Mosaic covenant, John tells us that in the new covenant, Jesus replaces that grace with more grace. And here's that interesting phrase that he uses in verse 16. For of his fullness we have all received, and grace upon grace. That particular phrase, grace upon grace, is something that should interest us. It, it can mean grace heaped on grace, that is grace stacked up on grace in the Lord Jesus Christ, because the new covenant is much more gracious than the old covenant. Um, just read the two and you'll easily come to that conclusion. But it can also mean grace instead of grace or grace in the place of grace. There was grace in the Old Covenant, as we've already seen, but it's been replaced by an even greater grace, a fullness of grace in the New Covenant. Now, the Old Covenant could only point to the one through whom grace would be realized, but as we look at the contrast the author to the Hebrews draws between the Old Covenant and the New Covenant, we see the Old Covenant didn't have the power to give a person the, the ability, as it were, to obey the law. And that's the reason why God brings in the new covenant. They did not continue in my law and I did not care for them, says the Lord. So I'm going to make a new law or a new covenant. I'm going to take that law and put it in their minds and I'm going to write it upon their hearts. The reason why God can do that is because the one who is God became man and obeyed and he died so that he could give grace. And this grace is giving us the power to be able to obey Jesus Christ. In the new covenant, he gives grace instead of grace. He gives grace heaped upon grace. He gives a fullness of grace to all who will trust him. In Jesus, there is this fullness of grace. So basically what John is telling us is this, that Jesus, who is the eternally begotten Son of God, became a man so that through his obedience and his death he might fulfill the law and the prophets. He might show us what all of that meant because he is the fulfillment of all of it. And he, through fulfilling these things, might bring grace, a fullness of grace, to those who would die without it, that is, to us who are all under the sentence of death. Now again, the whole point of John's writing this was so that you might be convinced this is true, so that you might reach out to Jesus and receive it because you can only receive this fullness that Jesus has if you actually trust him. And so I'm, I'll ask you what John's asking you this morning. Do you know this grace in, in your own life? Have you embraced the truth that is in the gospel? Not the truth that you choose to, to receive, not, not realities you choose to, to believe it, but as God tells us it is. Do you believe what he says about your condition? Do you believe that you are a sinner lost without hope apart from Jesus? Do you believe that you need to trust in Jesus and turn from your sins before you receive him, before you can? 
that you are a sinner and lost and that there is grace and forgiveness only in Jesus Christ? And have you trusted him? Does your life show that you have by embracing his truth? You see, you can't embrace the grace of Christ without the fullness of truth that's in him as well. And that fullness has not only to do with the fact that Jesus has fulfilled everything, that he is everything the Bible was talking about, but he is also the perfect example of how you are to live, the truth about how God wants you to live. Have you embraced that as well? Let me just challenge you this morning. Never to rest comfortably in your conversion to Christ unless you see Christ being formed in you. The way that you can know that you truly are saved by the Lord Jesus Christ is that you love him and you love his ways and you are following him. Jesus is being formed in you by the Holy Spirit. Well, if that is true of you, then rejoice. You've been born of God. That's something that only God, as we saw before, can bring about in your life. But if you don't see this, if you haven't trusted him, I would invite you to do so this morning. The Lord Jesus calls you to come to him. I mean, why, why would you perish when you know that God stands ready to receive you if you will only come and trust in his son? If you're only willing to let go of your sins that you might come? Why would you perish when there is so much grace, fullness of grace and truth in the Lord Jesus Christ? John wrote this gospel so that you might turn from your sins and that you might take hold of the one who is the Christ, who is the Savior, the only Savior of the world. There are not many ways to God. There is only one. The Bible says it is the Lord Jesus Christ. He himself said that. Why would you perish when you can take hold of him in faith and know that he will receive you and that he will forgive you and that he will transform you by his own power? There's no lack of willingness on God's part that you might come to him. The only lack of willingness might be on your part. And if you still are unwilling to come, then I pray that the Lord would change your hearts. He would change your minds by his Holy Spirit, that you might truly be born of God, that you might trust in this one who is the only way of salvation. Well, let's bow in just a moment of prayer and let's ask that the Lord would take what we've seen. And again, we've seen a lot. But let's not forget that this is the only way of salvation. God and man had to be this way. And that Jesus came that there might be a fullness of grace and truth. That there might be a fountain that is open to us. If we will only come, as the Old Testament says, and drink of this fountain. The Lord says you may come and drink freely if you are willing to come. So pray that God would make you willing.